Good morning. Thank you for joining us today um, for our first webinar Wednesday of the autumn season. Today we are looking at the danger below, so protecting against radon and methane. My name is Katie and I am the um, moderator here for this event, so if you have any questions throughout this morning's session, there's a little panel on the right hand side of your screen where you can submit questions to us via text, they'll pop up and what we'll do is we'll try and uh, answer as many as possible as we go, if not we'll pick them up at the end of the session. Or ultimately, if they are quite specific to an individual case, then maybe we'll, we could actually get back to you after the event. You can contact us like that, or we are on Twitter. You can use the hashtag CABECPD. Your presenter this morning, it's Kevin. Kevin Blunden, Deputy Chief Executive here at CABE, and he looks after all of the technical matters. So without further ado, I shall hand you over to Kevin. Good morning and welcome to the first of our webinar on Wednesdays for the new academic year. Um, our association sort of runs from September to September, so this is the first of a new program of events for us. Um, first of all, I'd like to allay all those fears. Although Channel 4 have put in a significant bid for webinar Wednesdays, um, we are remaining with CABE and neither Katie or myself will be leaving the program at any time soon. Um, what we won't be doing though is sharing our favourite recipes with you. Right, what we are going to do this morning is look at uh, issues relating to gases produced below ground that can have an adverse effect on occupants of buildings. So we're going to look at radon and we're going to look at methane. Um, so first of all, we'll kick off by looking at radon. Um, on the periodic table, it's one of the Nobel gases, um, but more importantly for us in terms of construction, it is a naturally occurring uh, radioactive gas that occurs given certain ground conditions, certain rock formations, and is present in most areas in small quantities. Um, so it occurs naturally, it's colourless, it's odourless, so it's difficult to be aware of and difficult to detect. Every building will to some degree contain radon. Um, with certain soil types, certain ground, ground conditions, rock formations, you can get higher levels than in others. And over the last three or four decades, we've become much more aware in the UK of the presence of radon in the ground. Um, methods of testing have become more sophisticated. And whereas in terms of its impact on buildings, if we look at the situation some 30, 40 years ago, it was considered only to be an issue in certain key areas within the country. Nowadays, there are much greater geographical regions that are considered to be prone to radon affecting the buildings. And just to give you an indication of how this has been around for quite a long while, I'm sat here today at CABE headquarters um, in Northampton. The premises were built specifically for us just about 40 years ago, and within our floor slab construction at ground floor, we have radon sumps and a fully running pump um, because of a potential risk of radon beneath the building, which actually for a commercial premises is somewhat unusual. So the levels of radon within the property will depend upon lifestyles and they will depend upon um, ventilation that people have in the premises, the size of the premises, the use of it. What won't necessarily affect radon levels is the measures we've taken in recent years to improve air tightness of buildings. Although the building has got far more air tight, actual infiltration by radon isn't necessarily just through gaps and cracks and joints, but actually through the structure itself. And ordinary um, waterproof membrane measures that we may put in may not be sufficient to stop the radon seeping through the membrane. So when we look at putting protection measures in, we have to look at the barriers we're using to make sure that their makeup is such that the molecules of radon won't actually percolate through that surface into the building. Somewhat strangely, the issue is now that as the building itself has become more airtight, once the radon's got into the building, there is more potential now that it will stay there rather than ventilate out 
naturally. So it's something that we have to have an increasing awareness of. And the problem with radon is being a radioactive gas, exposure to uh, the gas for long periods can increase the risk of developing lung cancer. And again, historically, although we've been aware of the link, it's been difficult to prove that radon has perhaps been the cause. Changes in lifestyle, changes in monitoring, and further research have established a clear link. But it's still something that, particularly in the public perception, isn't necessarily considered and thought of in terms of the property. Although increasingly, when somebody comes to buy a premises, they will become aware that there may be an issue with the premises they're looking at. So what do we do in relation to radon? Um, well, first of all, we have to establish if we're in an area that's at risk. And a lot of this is based upon um, information given to us by government departments, maps that are published for us to look at nationally, and guidance documents such as the BRE Guide on Radon Protection Measures. So the first step is always to look at a map and see, to see whether you are prone to radon being in the area. But to be honest, if there is any doubt, it is worth carrying out a test to establish whether or not there's likely to be an issue. And if you're looking at doing a speculative development, it may well be that it's sensible at the outset to design some basic precautions that later on can be added to if it's found that there is an issue with radon in the property. As I said just now, an awful lot of people only become aware of radon as an issue when they sell the premises and the searches that are done reveal that the premises is in a, an area that may be affected by radon and the question is simply asked about what precautions have been built in. This will quite often be pulled up on a survey if the surveyor is looking at the local radon maps and looking at what's going on. There is a process on the sale of the property where people can put a quick monitoring test into their premises um, to establish whether or not there's an issue. A little box comes, you sit it in the lounge, a couple of weeks later send it off to see the result, whether or not there's a problem. The problem with that sort of quick test is it is susceptible to abuse by the, the householder. If they want to make sure that there isn't a problem, then rather than putting the box in the living room, they might be tempted to put it out in the middle of the garden, um, and it'll show, lo and behold, there's not so much of an issue with the radon. Um, but at any stage where they think there's a possibility at site investigation stage, then realistically, um, some testing should be done to establish what the level's likely to be so that we can build in precautions for later on. And the precautions we're going to build in can be fairly straightforward. Um, it can be just having a granular fill beneath the slab with maybe perforated pipework and a sump, which will then lead to a discharge point on the external wall, which may be beat a natural vent, or later on, if there's a significant problem, may have a pump connected to it um, to physically draw the radon out. But obviously, the, the main concern, the main provision that we attempt to put in at the same time is to form a barrier at ground floor level to prevent the radon getting into the building. And that will mean looking at how we deal with services, um, how we deal with joints, lapping, um, penetrations through the membrane. It's the detailing that is fundamentally important when it comes to providing a barrier. So the sort of thing we're looking at is a, a continuous barrier right way through across the cavity, step down to form a cavity tray at the external wall. Care has to be taken at junctions, particularly at corners where we end up with fittings that have to work. So you'll find that manufacturers will um, make purpose-made corner fittings so that we can end up with a decent seal at those points. And then either a void beneath the slab or a granular fill in a sump, which either vent to outside or at some stage can have a pump fitted to them. Radon itself, once it gets outside, will dissipate, um, so the risk of it drifting back into the building isn't particularly large, and we don't necessarily have to ventilate this at high level. Radon pumps and, and, and sumps and vents can be at relatively low level within the building. So the critical issue is looking at the ceiling of the, the slab with some form of a membrane that will resist the radon penetration. As I say, from a designer's point of view, the other thing you have to consider are things like your services. So if you are bringing services into the property, be it water, electric, gas, drainage, as far as is practical, 
it's better to bring those up externally and bring them in above the barrier level rather than to bring them through the barrier. But if you do have to bring them through the barriers, it will be the case with some things like drainage, then realistically it's making sure that seal is maintained where that penetration occurs through the pipework. And the same sort of principles apply whenever we're trying to seal the ground floor against penetrations from below of, of gas, whether it's radon, whether it's methane, whether it's other uh, landfill gases. The main problem we're trying to achieve this in practice is about the workmanship. The, the attention to detail is critical. We have to pay attention to laps, to joints, to all of those penetrations, to the corner details. And then getting the right material, specifying the right material, and getting it in place, and the right standard of workmanship is absolutely critical. Now, as far as minimum standards are concerned, the building regulations do set minimum standards in protection against radon and landfill gas and methane but they tend to refer to other guidance such as the BRE guide for the practical application of how this, this works in reality. And there is a suggestion in some of the guidance that a good 1200 gauge polythene membrane may well act as a, as a radon barrier. You do have to look very carefully at this, as I say, because of the, the particle size, um, you can get penetration, but you're, the, the problem is, again, with the standard membrane, it's the jointing details, it's the lapping, it's the sealing, the penetrations through that, that tend to cause us problems. Um, once radon's there, it's not something that's going to have a lifespan and dissipate over time. Radon is there naturally in the ground. It will be there for the lifetime of the building. Sometimes when we're looking at other things like landfill gas, um, the, the, the gas generation, which may be a, a landfill, it may be vegetation on the ground, may be something of that sort, may have a limited life cycle, and then levels will tend to drop off. But as far as radon is concerned, it will be there for the life of the property. Okay. Um, so methane, then. Methane, um, similar sort of precautions that we take in terms of methane and landfill gas. Methane itself is a combination of chemical elements. Um, so um, its chemical formula is CH4. It's a part of landfill gas, which is generated as things degrade within the soil. Um, so particularly from tip sites, but it can free, be from um, vegetation and things of the like. So there will always be a level of methane within the atmosphere. The landfill gas that we get from, from landfill sites tends to be a combination of gases, which are primarily methane and carbon dioxide, but there will be a lot of volatile organic compounds within that as well. And it's that combination that gives methane gas its characteristic smell. So there is a smell with methane if it's contaminated um, in combination with everything else. Um, methane has a different issue in terms of uh, the effect on human beings. Obviously, sufficient concentration in the atmosphere will lead to respiratory problems and ultimately um, asphyxiation. But methane as well, in sufficient concentrations, is also highly explosive. And it doesn't have to be a huge concentration within the atmosphere. So once the methane gets into a building, whether it's uh, the main house, whether it's the garage, whether it's an outbuilding, as it builds up in terms of concentrations, it will form this, this potential for explosion. So generally, we would look at assessing the risk of potential methane in the ground. And again, we may well, at site investigation stage, do a fair bit of testing to establish where this actually sits and what the standards might be. But the general rule of thumb is if you are within 250 meters of a landfill site, the potential that the landfill gas will migrate horizontally to your and affect your potential building. Now, as far as how do we establish where landfill sites may be, most local authorities, particularly in their environment and health departments, will have a record of where all known landfill sites are. They may well have taken measures to attempt to seal the site, um, but when you're looking at a development, you have to consider the movement of the gas laterally. Now, obviously, one of the things that quite often happens is that we, do, we put our building 250 meters away from the landfill site, 
but the infrastructure to go with it may well be closer. So the, the road that leads to the property might be closer to the former tip site than the 250 meters. And uh, what do we then do? Within the road, we lay the sewer, um, and from the sewer, we lay lateral drainage. And a lot of these drainage and services systems that we put in, we disturb the subsoil and we backfill quite often with granular material, particularly with drainage and things like pea shingle, which actually in their own right become an easy traffic route for the methane to move to the building. So it's not necessarily just the case of saying, my building's 250 meters away, therefore I haven't got a problem because some of the things we're doing, like laying drainage laterals, may well actually encourage the methane to move um, more freely towards the building. And then obviously, potentially, the gas will follow the path of least resistance in the ground and follow that granular fill right the way through to the building up through the floor slab. Now, there are other ways of doing this. At the perimeter of the tip site or at a point between the development and the fill site, it is possible to dig deep trenches and granularly fill those so that actually the methane hits the trench and then goes up vertically rather than travelling horizontally towards the building, particularly if the trench is lined on the building side with a barrier to prevent the gas moving any further. And that might be the only solution if you, you discover that you're suddenly building close to a tip site or heaven forbid you suddenly realize that an awful lot of development is done in close proximity to what was a tip that nobody knew was there. But again, our general precautions in terms of methane tend to be about protecting the building against entry. Um, so there are a couple of guides we can be referred to to look at this. There's stuff from the Environment Agency. Um, there's other guidance out there from Syria. Methane itself is lighter than air and will rise naturally. Um, how much methane rises does depend on the weather. Um, where we've had last day or so, particularly good weather, high pressure, um, the amount of methane coming out of the ground will be less because the, the pressure is keeping it down. But during periods of low pressure, the methane will tend to increase in terms of um, movement into properties. So again, we have to look at it and the methane getting into our potentially airtight homes. So again, we're looking at a continuous barrier across the floor to try and deal with some of this stuff. I mentioned just now that methane is explosive, and it's thought that a concentration of somewhere around about 45 to 5% is sufficient to make the, the um, atmosphere within the building uh, completely explosive, and any slight spark might start off might set off a, a fire and an explosion. Excuse me. So it's relatively low concentrations from that point of view. What we should be doing then when we're looking to do a development is to carry out a risk assessment. Um, so as part of our first desktop survey and then the actual physical survey on the property, uh, carry out a risk assessment, establish whether there's any potential for methane or other landfill gas look at where the sources might be, look at where they're likely to move to, and as I say, consider things like pathways through the ground that are going to make this somewhat easier. So there is guidance again um, published on how to do this um, to give some, some, some background to the designer and the developer on how they should look at the site and what might be an appropriate way forward. When we get back then to trying to deal with the actual property, it's a very similar sort of issues that we saw with the radon. And we have the same concerns, the same issues. So we are basically looking at putting barriers into the construction to physically stop the gas entering the building. We have the same issues with the materials and the workmanship as we do with radon. The difference with methane is once we've collected it, rather than discharging at low level, we will look to discharge methane at high level. Um, so once you've collected it beneath the slab, whether it be through pipework, through a sump, through a granular material, we will look to draw that out and ventilate at high level. And again, that may or may not be assisted by a pump on that system. The reason for the difference in, in, in where we discharge is purely because of the um, lighter and air nature of the methane gas. 
and the potential that if we discharge at low level, it's still there in close proximity to the building, still at a potentially explosive concentration. The other main difference that we, we tend to see is that uh, methane as a, an issue in terms of building is considered to be a problem across all building types, and it's recognized as a problem across all building types because of the explosive nature. That will affect uh, a dwelling, an office, an industrial unit in equally the same way. So we have to take the same level of precautions. Radon, however, um, it is, a, it is a, an issue when you are exposed to it over prolonged periods. So in buildings that don't have a lot of people or people who don't work there for long periods of time, there may not be as much need for protection, although generally it's considered now that you will provide it to commercial premises because to a certain extent we are in a um, claim culture, so if there is an issue, we do have to look at potentially who's, who's responsible in those situations. And you may well see in extreme cases where a lot of methane is being produced that actually the buildings, particularly industrial buildings, tend to ventilate at a high level and then burn the methane off. And I'm sure many of you will have come across um, projects now where actually people are looking to capture the methane and use it as a fuel source um, to actually add to the, the energy um, used by the building and therefore reduce their reliance on other um, areas. So we do have to make sure that we're trying to um, avoid the, the, the build up in all building types. Okay, um, there's a couple of, um, there's a quick little question popped in here um, regarding ingress via drainage laterals. Should soil and vent stacks be ventilated and unventilated sub, sub stacks with Durgos avoided? Um, no, there's no real reason why you should avoid air admittance valves like a Durgo valve on your drainage because ultimately the drainage system, the stack, the drainage below ground should be water and gas tight and the point where the drain actually penetrates the building should be sealed around. Now there is the potential, I suppose what, what, what we're driving at with the question is, will the gas penetrate into the actual drainage pipe through the wall of the pipe and therefore should we ventilate as a traditional stack rather than a potentially an air admittance valve? In theory the air admittance valve itself only lets air back in. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily vent gases out. Um, the other issue is that if we were concerned about gases penetrating through the material of the pipework to get into the stack, then the back out anyway. So no, I wouldn't necessarily say avoid um, air admittance valves or unvented sub stacks where you've got this particular situation. Um, somebody's asked the question, are there any known instances of explosions in buildings due to methane? Um, there have been cases, uh, particularly, uh, to be fair, in outbuildings, things like sheds and garages, um, but that was the main driver for looking to put something into the building regulations in the first place. Because we're aware of the issues, uh, we don't tend to have some, so much now, it's not headline news, um, but again, it is, it is a question of being aware of where the, the previous fill sites might be, and the, big, the biggest issue, particularly facing um, local authorities and environment health is actually identifying where all of the historic fill sites may well have been. Um, and you'll see if you if you talk to, to environmental health departments, they will have lists of where the fill sites are. They will also have an expected lifespan for that site actually generating landfill gases. Although, to be honest, because we've only been dealing with this for the last few decades, um, our, our knowledge is such that it, it's difficult to know exactly how gas production from landfill will decline over a period of time. Um, so the question of, I'm building near to a very old landfill, but actually it was there 100 years ago, is it safe to assume that everything's degraded and nothing's being produced anymore? It's very difficult to say for certain that that would be the case, and taking precautions is the sensible thing to do. Okay, um, so, well, uh, getting back to where I was, in terms of, uh, in terms of methane, um, once we've taken all the precautions, right, put the right membranes in and tried to make sure that we've, we've covered off our jointing details, then we can be reasonably happy that it's done. But it does require quite a high level of supervision 
to make sure it's done properly. It does require uh, an area of expertise and understanding on the part of the workforce who are actually doing the role and trying to make sure that actually these things are sealed up properly. And, and clearly, there's an ongoing issue for the incoming owner of the property to realize that there are precautions that are there and things that they need to do. As I say, a lot of new properties quite often include um, a sump and pipework beneath the floor slab with a terminal at the external wall so that should the property later on be subject to an issue, and particularly in terms of radon, then pumps can be connected on later on. But obviously the, the end user needs to know that once the building's settled down, they really need to be doing some testing to see whether there is an issue with radon. It's not necessarily sufficient to say, well, I put something in there and then put the reliance on the end user, um, unless there's that element of education to the end user that they need to understand what's going on. And they need to understand the importance of these things as well. As I said right at the beginning, we have a pump to a, a, a sump system under this building. It's absolutely essential that we regularly make sure that that pump is actually doing its job, that it's maintained and it continues to work. Otherwise, we've negated the whole purpose of the exercise. Okay. Um, Let's just have a look. There's another question coming here said, should radon and methane installations be provided with a 10-year insurance-backed guarantee? Um, I think, obviously, there's an awful lot of debate in the industry at the moment about guarantees and warranties and, and what's covered, all sorts of bits and pieces. Um, there was a, a rerun of a, a program this morning on BBC, Rip Off Britain, which was talking about the, the role of warranties in the, in the construction sector. Um, I would suggest that if we're looking at barriers, particularly in terms of construction, which may include preformed trays, um, corner details, um, preformed uh, fittings to go around pipes, so to, to fit in and, and bond with the, the overall membrane across the floor, then I would expect that most of the manufacturers of those products would be offering some form of certification so that the job, the, the product is fit for purpose and on the back of that some sort of form of warranty for their product. Um, now, that's relatively easy if it's a manufacturer's product and it's their people doing the installation. Quite often, warranties and guarantees that relate to the performance of a product in something like this are all well and good, but if they simply say our product is guaranteed if it's installed correctly, um, then quite often the case will be that once something goes wrong and an investigation is carried out, it, it's established that actually what went wrong was the installation was incorrect. So it's got to be part of an overall package. But yes, you, if you were looking to specify these systems, you would be looking for some sort of warranty or guarantee from the manufacturer of the product and some sort of a, um, affirmation that it's been installed correctly. Okay. All right. Right. Uh, somebody's asking the question, if basic radon protection is asked for, will a 1200 gauge DPM be sufficient with good workmanship, or should a gas membrane be used? As I said, the, some of the guidance does suggest that a 1200 gauge DPM might be sufficient as a radon barrier. The, the issue with it is, it's, it's about the jointing details, it's about sealing all the joints, it's about how you lap it and seal it to a cavity tray. And particularly what we find is if somebody using 1200 gauge um, DPM, there is the tendency that, that it may suffer minor damage, but there's also the issue that because you're not using a specific gas proof product, manufacturers aren't necessarily making all those bits and pieces for you. And what I would suggest you do to understand this, this problem, if you like, is sometime during the rest of the day, get hold of a polythene bag, um, or a wrapper from a, a, a journal or something of that sort and try and fold it as you would to do a corner of a stepped cavity tray linking to a membrane and you will find whatever way you fold that it's incredibly difficult to do it without getting creases and gaps in a way that you would effectively be able to seal that corner so a lot of the systems that they're providing specific gas proof membranes whether it's for radon or whether it's for methane have preformed corners that are manufactured in factory conditions so that you end up with something that seals 
but actually takes care of that corner detail so that there's no overlapping and lapping and creating gaps and folds. Um, so it can be done, but it's incredibly difficult and I would always recommend specifying a membrane that's specifically been designed as a gas proof membrane. Right, let's just see if there's any other questions popping up. I've lost my mouse somewhere. There we go. Right, Katie, have you picked up on any other questions? Hello, yes, just, oh, let me just turn my other body down, sorry, echo that. Um, yeah, just talking about your membrane, um, Jeff's asked if it has to be installed by a specialised accredited installer. It won't always necessarily be installed by an accredited installer. Um, a lot of materials are there available to buy direct from the manufacturer's install, and as long as they're done correctly following the manufacturer's instructions, there shouldn't necessarily be an issue with it. What I would say with it is look carefully at the manufacturer's instructions, look at what they are offering in terms of a guarantee. It may well be that some manufacturers will do a, a supply and install, some might just supply. If there is an additional cost of the supply and install, there will be. Um, it may well be in the long term that that's a, a, a reasonable investment to make on behalf of the client to ensure that the job is actually done properly. Okay, I've picked up on another one here saying, if we're in an area where radon levels are known to be low, should building control request a full site investigation report for small developments, or would a simple postcode check suffice? It is always a difficult one because the guidance is suggesting that you should do a risk assessment based upon whether there's a likelihood of the gases being around. And the first instance would be to go online to the national databases or to go to the BRE guidance document and look at the map for the local area and see whether it indicates that there's likely to be an issue with radar. It's always difficult to ask for a full site investigation. Um, what I would say is if you look at the situation where we are, um, the current maps that we use for radon that are required to be referred to by the building regulations are still um, a bit old in terms of time scale. But if you compare those to the maps before that, which were sort of a decade before, and the original ones a decade or so before that and before that, um, in reality you'll see that the areas that we now understand as being affected by radon are significantly more extensive than they were when we first started to think of the issue. When we first started with radon maps, it was bits of Cornwall, bits of Derbyshire, and, and anywhere basically with mainly a granite subsoil. Um, as we become aware, as we do more testing, it becomes obvious that it's more of a problem everywhere else. So I would say that in your local area, if you have reason to believe that there might be an issue, if you think people have had been testing and finding there are problems, then asking for somebody to at least do a form of risk assessment, whether that's a full site investigation or some other form of study, so that they can convince building control that they've done what's necessary, might well be fine. As far as the approved document is concerned, the guidance is really saying if you check that you're in an area, if you're not in an area affected, that might be as far as your risk assessment needs to go. But I think it does require that sort of level of local knowledge to determine whether or not um, you feel there's going to be a problem in your area. But I would have, as I say, you know, 20, 30 years ago, a lot of people would quite happily have said, we're not in a radon susceptible area, which now, if you look at the maps, you would conclude probably are. Um, what else are we looking at? With regard to landfill site locations, are there any other maps than those that belong to the local authority? Um, there may be odd maps with uh, large landholders, but there is an obligation on local authorities to keep maps of refuse tip sites. As I say, they're usually held by the environmental health team, um, so there's an obligation there. So that would be your main source of information. Uh, on science site investigation reports, we have highlighted high levels of CO2. This is a natural occurrence. Yes, I mean, a lot of these gases, whether we're talking landfill gas, whether we're talking CO2, methane, radon, radon, they do all occur naturally in certain concentrations. And depending on subsoil conditions, you will get additional concentrations. Now, as far as CO2 is concerned, again, CO2 in, in buildings, in sufficient concentrations, is enough to cause problems with breathing and ultimately asphyxiation but it's not something that's addressed in regulation in terms of 
dealing with ventilating because it occurs naturally in buildings as well as a result of the, the presence of people. If it's been shown up as a report to be at a level where it's going to cause a potential risk to health, it's still a ground um, contaminant and therefore the developer would still have to identify what they intend to do to deal with it. Um, somebody's asking, is the 200 Becquerel level for radon likely to change at that point? This is the sort of notification level that makes us believe that it's going to be a problem. I think at some point reviews will happen and it may well be that it will depend on the rate of incidence of illness and health as to whether it needs to change or not. What you will find is that the UK's notification levels are significantly different than other countries. So we will learn not only by our own experience, but experience overseas as well. Let's see if I can pick Kevin, up. if we could just go back up. There's a question in there about um, are there any issues in having combined systems for radon and methane in terms of removing the gases from, vo from voids below the building? I don't know if you've seen that one. All right, okay. Can, yeah, it's a good, good question because obviously um, we tend to think of them in, in terms of two different systems. What I would say is if you are in an area that unfortunately is affected by potentially ra radon and methane, um, the barrier you choose may well be suitable to keep both out of the building. The difference would be in how you ventilate because as I said before, radon you can tend to ventilate at low level, methane tends to vent at high level. What I would suggest is if you've got a combination of the two, then you would ventilate at high level, probably with pumps on the system to make sure it draws the, rad the radon and the methane through at high level, um, just from a practical point of view. You'd have to look at where the, the vent is to make sure that the gases don't potentially spill back into the building. But you would take the sort of most onerous approach from the two of them, I think, as being the way to move forward. Um, I do take on board, there was a comment there about a manufacturer's warranty only being as good as the manufacturer, so if they go out of business, then um, the warranty is no longer valid to a certain extent. Again, you can look at those warranties, see if they're underwritten by anybody, but that is a common situation we face. And as a result, I would suggest that when you're looking at a manufacturer in a product, you try and look at somebody with a proven track record who seems to have a, a reasonable chance of surviving in the long term. Okay. I think, unless you're going to tell me something different, Katie, that's probably picked up on yeah, I was just most gonna, of the questions more, we've got there. I was just going to more sort of acknowledge um, Charles's comments about um, being involved with a refurb rather than natural new build, and he's saying that it's actually even more uh, tricky to yeah. deal with. I mean, obviously, if, you, if you're involved with a refurbishment product and alteration and adaptation, it is incredibly difficult if you become aware there was a problem that you weren't aware of before. And as I say, what we see a lot of now is surveyors picking up on property sales, the potential for radon in an area, um, those selling the property being asked to maybe carry out a test, and then the question is what do you do as a remedial measure to your existing property um, to build in protection? Because it's relatively easy as a new build to build in a continuous barrier across the floor, link it to cavity trays, much, much more difficult when you're looking at it in terms of an existing building with a problem that you've got to then try and sort out. And you will end up cutting into structure, trying to form a permanent barrier. Um, it may well be that you can look at um, other ways of trying to do it. So if it, if, if it was you know, a, a refurbishment alteration project with methane, it might be that you do actually dig granular trenches around the property to try and vent the gas through the trenches rather than into the property. But it can be an incredibly difficult situation when you're dealing with a refurbishment. The other thing that's very similar that I think causes people a lot of problems are when there's an existing property that's having a, an extension put on um, and it's identified that actually it's in an area and therefore the extension requires some form of protection. But at that point, there's no regulatory framework to go back and address the existing premises uh, and you can end up with this uh, strange anomaly. And I, I, I dealt with a project once as well that, that had implications for everybody in the surrounding area. It was actually um, social housing, but the original social housing had been built around a, a green um, playing field area. It was decided to build on the green playing field area and investigation showed that part of that was fill um, 
and generating methane, and part wasn't. But what it did show is not only were the new dwellings that were being proposed going to be subject to methane and have to have precautions built in, but a lot of the properties that are actually in the same ownership from the, from the social housing provider that were already existing would already also be being affected by the methane. So the issue there was all the existing um, residents would become aware that their properties weren't adequately protected. And retrofitting and trying to do something from that point of view is incredibly difficult. Now, if it's a relatively small fill area, it might actually be the case is to rip everything out of the fill and move it to yet another site to cause a problem somewhere else. Um, but you have to look at what else can be done maybe to seal the area or to get rid of the gas in some other means other in terms of direct venting from the fill uh, and burning it off at that point maybe. So yes, existing buildings, extensions, alterations, do cause us a lot of issues um, in terms of trying to retrofit some of this technology. Okay, I think that's probably picked up all of the questions I can see. I do apologize if I've missed anything there. Um, what we will do is pull these together, put some frequently asked questions on our website um, so that you can pick those up later on. And obviously this webinar will then be going on to um, our normal YouTube channel in the normal way. Okay, unless there's any other questions, I'm going to hand back to you then, Katie. One's just popped in, Kevin. Do you want to have a quick look? <laughs> um, Ooh, another right. <laughs> okay, I'm just trying to find those because mine don't seem to be coming up in any particular okay, sense right. of order on my screen. Um, the one from Jackie. Right. Oh, we're talking about... oh, sorry, go on. Uh, no, it's all right. Uh, where's that then, Katie? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm bottom. Struggling. Just come in. Just putting barriers and other forms of protection in one place, e.g. extension, oh, yes. make it worse in the main house. Um, there is an argument that, yes, yeah, that if you put a barrier into an extension, there is an argument that actually what happens to the gas is it travels laterally and then ends up in the main building. So there is an argument that that could potentially make it worse. Um, so, but the in essence, what you do, just say, okay, the existing house is bad, therefore the extension doesn't have to be any better. Uh, it's debatable. I, I think it would depend what it is. Um, if, it, if the extension was something that wasn't going to be used that often and we would maybe look at radon, obviously the major issue with radon is, is the areas you're going to spend a long period of time, bedrooms, lounges, that sort of thing. Um, but even so, I think you still have to look at putting a barrier in but look at what else you can do to stop things migrating laterally. But it's a difficult situation. There is no definite answer or not. Um, right, what was the other one you spotted, Kate? Um, just, again, it should be at the bottom. It's quite a long question from Stephen. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I do apologize. For this. Unfortunately, the screen I'm picking up isn't listing the... Ah, there we go. Isn't it. listing the questions in, the, in any sensible order at all. Um, right, in my experience, if the radon barrier is laid on top of the suspended slab and taken straight through the external walls, a separate cavity tray can then be placed over. This removes the issue of dressing the radon barrier down the cavity and trying to form corners. If the membrane or separate items that are glued and taped on site is, is, can be the issue, and you're right, the issue is, so if we can avoid the um, the, the lapping business, then fine. Yes, I, I, I perfectly understand what you're saying there. If you, if you actually take the membrane straight through rather than stepping down the cavity, you do avoid these issues of, of lapping and, and moving through. You will have to look at the, the, the issue then from the point of view of, um, because you seal straight across the, the cavity at that level, how you effectively do your damp proofing within the property. So you could be putting in a separate cavity tray and damp proof courses, and that would possibly be another way of looking at it. What you've got to take into account with all that and is where the levels sit and how it actually works. But it may well be that that might be a way of trying to achieve a, a simpler approach to putting the barriers in. So I, I'll take that, that on board, yeah. Okay, great. Right, I think we will draw it to a close there because we're more or less at our normal appointed hour for wrapping these things up. Um, there are a lot of issues there, which, I, as I say, I'll try and wrap up into some guidance. Um, when we put the questions up, we'll also include references to the other guidance documentation that's available to you out there. 
And as with all these things, if any questions occur afterwards, just email us and get in touch. Okay, back to you then, Katie. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you, Kevin, for your time this morning and your expertise on the subject. I think everyone will agree that uh, it was a really useful session and it was also um, some really good questions coming in, as Kevin's just said, from everyone. Um, this is, as we've mentioned at the beginning, for those of you who are with us, the first in our webinar Wednesdays for the academic year 2016-17. We've got one a month now, right, right up until July. Full details can be found on our website, cbld.com slash webinars, and we've got subjects such as flooding, part R, sound insulation, outdoor events. So we've got quite a range of, of subjects that we're going to be looking at. But again, your feedback's always welcome on things that you'd like to hear us, hear us do. So uh, our next webinar is on the 12th of October next month, and we will be looking at the pros and cons of BS9999. So again, feel free to sign up, join us, and we will see you then. Again, any questions, as Kevin said, send them over. But thank you for joining us today.